dance is a good move. Why you dancing? Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. Yoo-hoo, running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode, one episode at a time. And the episode we are watching through and talking about this week is Season 3, Episode 11, T-Shirt of the Living Dead. Some say it gave him the power to know and do anything. And that's why most of the dead... In the underworld, referred to him as an ass. T-shirt of the Living Dead premiering October 10th, 2004. I don't know if I've seen this one on TV or not, although I'm pretty familiar with it. And a part that really stood out to me was the beginning of this one. I really remembered them being at the museum, but once we dive into the episode today, we will see they're not really there for that long. They're mostly just at their house, and this being... In my mind, one of those episodes that Aqua Teen really does best, where it's just the characters kind of dicking around at home, stuff's kind of happening to them, but mostly it's them just talking about it and reacting to it. And of course, it in this episode being the supernatural t-shirt that Shake steals from the museum and then (laughs) hands down to Meatwad. So in a way, it's kind of one of those Meatwad gets powers episodes, but he doesn't go as far with it as he does in something like Balloon and Stein or dumber days. So excited to see how Meatwad wields his power in this episode. But of course, before we do that, we've got a bunch of other stuff to talk about first. First up, our Aqua Teen news this week. Again, Dave, Matt, Ned, and Dana will be in Boston on May 20th of this year, 2023, at the Boston Comedy Festival showing an unfinished Aqua Teen episode based on Boston, but this is not the Boston episode that leaked in 2015. This is a new one, never before seen by anybody, not even the guys who made it. And this is public information at this point. I've read it around, so I don't think I'm spilling any beans here. So again, if you could make it, definitely do so even just to catch the sort of panel that they will be doing there. Again, Matt Malero doesn't do a lot of public appearances, so definitely it's worth it just for that. But also, I mean, you've got Dave Willis, Ned Hastings, and Dana Snyder. You know it's going to be a good time. But speaking of Matt Malero, a a reminder that on May 21st of this year, we have Postocalypse premiering, and I've seen this pop up online now that that is the release date. Of course, I mentioned before that Matt told me himself that's what it was, but they seem to be moving that way, and from what I understand, it is coming out, even though as of this recording, uh, which is (laughs) May 13th, there isn't really much posted about it online, but it is coming out, Postocalypse, on Tubi for free on May 21st. You better see it, because uh, it's possible that I will be doing a podcast episode on it when it comes out, so get ready. That is our Aqua Teen news. On to our podcast news. First of all, just want to say that I was invited on to my, one of my favorite podcasts of all time, Roach Coach. I've been listening to these guys for five years now, and they are one of the podcasts that inspired me to start my own podcast. Roach Coach was the very first non-professional podcast I got into, and by that I mean it was made by normal people who have day jobs, not people who, who podcast professionally. But they showed me that normal people can make an excellent podcast too, and it was such an honor to be invited on. Roach Coach is a music podcast. We talked about one of my favorite bands, Static X, their album Cult of Static. Not a very good album, honestly. It's probably the band's worst, but Roach Coach is a comedy podcast, so we had lots of fun. It was a good time. Those guys are improv actors, so it was a blast, a real dream come true. Thank you for listening to this podcast, because no doubt that played a role in them inviting me onto their podcast, so just such a dream come true. I've been such a fan of them for so long, and it was so fun to do that episode. Honestly, in my opinion, one of the best podcast episodes I've ever been a part of, and that's because those guys are pros, so I guess it's pretty easy, but it just turned out so great. I was so thrilled about it. So again, that is Roach Coach. You can find them at gabbermedia.com. Whatever you're listening to this in, you can just type in Roach Coach. That is R-O-A-C-H-K-O-A-C-H. Link in the description to the episode. So moving on to some Aqua Teen info here. 
In the previous episode, Dusty Gazangas, we had Andre, the utility worker. At the time, we did not know who voiced him. Your power's back on. Hey, can I have one of those strawberries? No! Get out of here! But now, we have the dirty answers. And I want to shout out Dave Willis, first of all, for helping find the answer here. But also, listener Carson, he really dug in and tried to find some voice actors who could be the voice of Andre. And Carson didn't find the voice actor, but I emailed those names to Dave, and that kind of got the ball rolling. Dave then blasted out to the editors who work on Aqua Scene saying, hey, does anybody remember who did the voice of this character? Because as I mentioned in that podcast episode, they had used this guy before in an episode of Space Ghost. And Dave was like, yeah, he worked in in shipping at Turner and we would use him because he had a great voice. Well, thanks to John Breston, editor, producer on Aqua Teen, for remembering that the actor's name was Oliver Nichols. He is the one who did the voice of Andre, the utility worker. And he actually also did an episode of Squidbillies. And then he did two other episodes of Aqua Teen, which we have not covered yet. So Oliver, we'll be getting back to him, but it's exciting to know even these little details, you know, who's voicing which characters, because it was a voice we had never heard before. So of course, we got to find out who it is. And sometimes, you know, as luck would have it, we get to actually find out who it is, which is not not common. But uh, in this case, we did. Again, that was Oliver Nichols. So moving on here, we finally have a beautiful resolution to our Aqua Teen Hentai search. If you are unfamiliar, if you are unaware, supporter of the show, Ian, he was over in Japan. I asked him ahead of time, hey man, I heard about this, this legendary Aqua Teen Hentai over there. I don't know if you could find it for me, but I need it to save my failing marriage. We need to inject some spiciness into it to keep things alive. Ian, he he risked his life for this search. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, Ronnie, how's it going? Ian here. Sorry about my last voice message. I was uh, walking around in Matsuhiro's place, and I tripped, and then my phone died, and a whole bunch of stuff happened. Sorry for the late update on this. Anyway, Matsuhiro Malero, he's a great guy. A uh, little, little uh, private, but um, after I got to know him, totally cool dude he said he totally wants to meet you if you're ever out here unfortunately the bad news is he did not have the aqua teen hentai we were looking for um what i saw in my last voice message so i guess he had it at one point and he lost it but he still had just the front cover uh, and he was kind enough to let me have that to aid with our search in the future uh so I've enclosed a photo of that for you to take a look at and share with anyone as you see fit. Hopefully next time I'm out here, we can uh, use that to continue the search. But for now, that's all I got for you, man. I got to head back to the States in just a couple days. Anyway, hope you're doing good. Sorry again for my last message. Don't worry about it. Everything's totally fine. All right. Catch you later. Ian, my heart is so relieved that you are okay of course your last voice message was was very terrifying but you know that's really the risk and and that's my fault for not telling you all this ahead of time don't walk around Matsuhiro Malero's house and voice message at the same time it's not safe you can't do both at once nobody's brain has that sort of bandwidth now of course now that we know Ian is okay we could focus a little bit on the matter at hand here this Aqua Teen Hentai and Ian in fact he did send over the photo of the front cover of the Aqua Teen Hentai manga. And I gotta tell you, it is fucking flaming hot. You're gonna like what you see here. I'm getting all riled up just looking at it. I mean, I, I, I think it's too explicit to even describe on this show. All I can say is, if the burrito in colon movie film is the Aqua Teen's mom then it's looking like Carl is their new dad. That's all I'm saying. So check the description if you want to see just the cover. Of course, we still have to find the full thing. Maybe at some point when Ian can get back to Japan, now he has some sort of some sort of thing to go off of. Maybe eventually we could get the whole thing. But in the meantime, I think this will do just the trick. I think this will buy me at least six more months in my marriage. Ian, I salute you. I I bow to you. I shake your hand for everything you do. Not only with the hentai search, but your fantastic work over at corndogcentral.com. For all the 12 ounce mouse fans, it's only a matter of time until you track the 12 ounce mouse hentai down. 
as well. So thank you so much, Ian. Of course, you could find him on Twitter at Speed Beats with a Z or a Z if you are in like Canada or the UK or something. So that is it. That is our Aqua Teen news this week, our podcast news, our community stuff. Ian, glad you're okay. Let's see what in the damn ass, bitchin' ass hell was going on the week that T-Shirt of the Living Dead premiered. Let's check it out, damn it. Still swimming around, being a mediocre counterpart to Finding Nemo this week, we have Shark Tale bringing in 31 million. Save some millions for the rest of us, Shark Tale. Come on, how greedy. I don't really have anything to add to this one. Of course, check out the Dusty Gazangas episode if you want to hear me talk about Shark Tale. Still haven't seen it, but I'll get to the bottom of it soon because I recently rewatched Finding Nemo. I thought it held up pretty dang well. I want to see how this film does. So that is our brief film news this week. Let's jump in and give a sweet little listen to our top album this week. That's right, we have Green Day now in the big boy spot, the top album spot, with 267,000 copies of American Idiot sold. Now, we talked about the title track, American Idiot, in a previous episode, but now we get to talk about some of the other songs on the album, such as Holiday, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, the track that you just heard, and also Wake Me Up When September Ends. I forgot that song was on that record too. So there's four very big songs on that record at the time. I remember especially Holiday and Boulevard of Broken Dreams being huge when those were, you know, the big singles of the time. And I remember, I think I only ever got one iTunes gift card, and it was for $25, and two of the songs I bought off iTunes were Holiday and Boulevard of Broken Dreams. I just loved those songs so much at the time. I still do, too. I think that they are very good. But the interesting thing about this record for how well it did is that, first of all, it's it's a concept album. I mean, you don't see those selling gangbusters very often, it w- which is, of course, very unconventional for Green Day, which was mostly a pop punk kind of band. Now they're doing this kind of rock opera about this this character named the Jesus of Suburbia. This ultimately being a political album, I think. They're just angry about the Iraq War, the George W. Bush administration. Back in these days, it wasn't so cliche to be angry about the government. It was a little bit more artistic and cool to see bands doing things like that back then, as opposed to now. You don't really see it as much. But the interesting thing about this record, and I think kind of an inspirational thing, is that initially they were working on a record called Cigarettes and Valentines. However, while working on it, the master tapes were stolen. And they decided, hey, let's just completely start over. Fuck all those other songs that we were doing. Let's start from scratch. And when they started from scratch, they came up with American Idiot, which really just gave the band this second life. You don't see that very often when Green Day were already pretty dang big, but then their career took a little bit of a slump with their previous album, Warning. But then this record came out and it just reintroduced them to a whole new audience, myself included, because Green Day's 90s work would have been too early for me to have really have heard at the time, probably, at least on MTV and things like that. So I went back and listened to this album for the very first time. I have to say, outside of the singles... I wasn't that interested. There wasn't anything else that I felt like it was a hidden gem. I'm like, all right, there's these four great songs, and I still feel that way. But it wasn't a bad album by any means. And again, just Green Day doing something new. You gotta love it when you see it. When you see a band take a risk, make this kind of tonal shift like this, and just pull it off. Hey, I'm not gonna be mad about that. So that is American Idiot by Green Day, an important album. And again, like, this is one of the first records to come out that I was really cognizant of, of being like, oh, this is new music, this just came out, and that kind of started my journey of of following new music at that time. 
So jumping to our other music this week, our top single on the Billboard charts is again Goodies by Sierra, which it has been for the last few weeks. And then our top alternative song is Green Day with the song American Idiot. So I mean, this week for Green Day, they're doing well. Top of two Billboard charts, at least. I mean, these are only the ones that we're looking at here. They're doing well. Good for them. So moving on to our video games this week. Let me mention a couple games coming out this past week. We have Mortal Kombat Deception coming to the PlayStation 2. Tribes Vengeance coming to Windows. I have played Tribes Ascend, which came out a few years later. And in the Tribes games, they're basically, I think they're first-person shooters from my memory. But you also have, like, jetpacks, and you can, like, jetpack around. Uh, Pretty fun games. Uh, Otherwise... There is uh, Conflict Vietnam coming to Windows, Mega Man Zero 3 coming out to Game Boy Advance. Otherwise, the game I want to talk about briefly is Tony Hawk's Underground 2 coming out to all the platforms, basically, in North America. And my understanding of the Underground games, because I'm only familiar with the first couple Tony Hawk games, but the Underground games, I think, are a little bit sillier. They're more kind of jackass-inspired than the other games, which... We're not serious games, but had more of a serious take than these games, I think. But I was looking up how Underground 2 compares to the rest of the series, and I guess this one's just kind of a middle of the road. It's a little too wacky for some people. I know a criticism that this game got was it didn't really expand a whole lot on the original Underground game. Like, there aren't a ton of new moves or anything like that. It's mostly like a new storyline, which was already kind of panned. But overall, the game seems to do well. Again, I haven't played these, but I was watching some gameplay. Let me tell you, those skateboard tricks, they look like a lot of fun. So, all right, it is October 10th, 2004, and you are not watching Shark Tale again this week because you're a skater, baby. You're busy skating around them streets. You're doing ollies. You're doing some kickflips. Maybe if you feel like it, you're also doing some pop shove-its. You love it, but you can't skate all day because eventually the sun goes down. So, you gotta go inside. You put on your Green Day CD because... I mean, did you hear me? You're a skater. Obviously, you're going to listen to some Green Day. And then you want to skate some more, and you can't do it in real life, so you got to do it virtually. You're jumping into Tony Hawk's Underground 2 to get your fix. You're just addicted to skating. I think that you need to go to a -a Skatadone clinic, get rid of that board, get some help. But until then, your non-skateboard-addicted brother comes in the room and says... Get the fuck off Tony Hawk. I'm watching Adult Swim. What is your brother gonna see on Adult Swim this night? I'll tell ya. First up, we have Family Guy with Emission Impossible at 11 p.m. And this one is... I remember this one very vividly. This is the one where Peter and Lois want to have kids again. Or they want to have another kid. And Stewie doesn't like that idea. So he has to, like, go into Peter's dick and then into his balls to kill the sperm that is, like, gonna create his brother or whatever. It's a bonkers episode, but just a great classic Family Guy episode. After that, at 11.30 p.m., we have Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, with Back to the Present. At 11.45 p.m., we have C-Lab 2021 with A-S-H-D-T-V. And uh, this stands for Adult Swim HDTV. And this is not a new episode, but it's a relatively new episode. It premiered in June, late June of 2004. So it's only, uh, you know, it's less than four months old at this point. So a relatively new C-Lab episode. After that, we get this episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force, T-Shirt of the Living Dead. As usual, our only new episode this night. After that, at 12.15 a.m., we get the Brack Show with Sexy New Brack Show Go. Of course, not a new episode, but in this one, we have Brack winning a serial contest, which gives him his own TV show. Isn't that crazy? You know, Brack getting his own show on the Brack Show, and uh, a Japanese man comes to direct it. And this Japanese man, my understanding, he is played by George Takai. So, quite the get. But I I guess I don't know how, like, big he was at that time. Of course, he was still, you know, George Takai. It's not like he was nobody. But I have to think he's probably more popular now because of his social media presence. But still, a very big get at the time. 12.30 a.m. gives us the Venture Bros with Tag Sale, You're In It. And then 1 a.m. we get the Oblongs with The Golden Child. And 1.30 a.m. Home Movies with Method of Acting. So the same exact lineup we've been getting this entire season, I'm pretty sure. But... Those shows, they're all good shows, so you can't be mad about it. So that is our lineup this night. I think we're ready to go in and talk about T-Shirt of the Living Dead. Let's go talk about this stinky old shirt. Uh, 
This episode of Dancing is Forbidden, as all episodes, is brought to you by the magical t-shirt wielding patrons over at patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden. These moon masters pitching in their hard earned money that they could spend on museum tickets to support this show instead. And we've had a lot of new signups lately, so I'm only going to shout out two today and then we'll do two next time. That way I'm not just listing off names for half an hour. So first up, I want to re-welcome on a steel horse he rides well not really but we have carl joining back on at the ten dollar tier the number one in the hood g tier and uh carl he drives a truck but uh for some reason that bon jovi song gets stuck in my head whenever i think about that but carl he's honk honking up and down them highways listening to dancing is forbidden blasting it out his windows and guess what he's paying for the privilege Trust me, Carl, glad to have you back on board here. And I also want to shout out at the $10 tier. We have Leche Reton 69. That is quite a name here. Believe me when I say this character, they have a uh, kitty cat as their Patreon picture holding some sort of submachine gun, I think. But I can't make out the whole thing. I don't know how to make it full screen. Come on, Patreon. Why are you doing me dirty like this? But Leche Reton 69, thank you for signing up here at the number one in the Hoodji tier. You truly are the number one in the Hoodji, alongside Carl and all of our other $10 patrons. Thank you both so much, Carl uh, LR69. Appreciate you both. Holy hell, man. Let me tell you, if uh, the Patreon keeps growing like this, goddammit, I might actually be able to put some serious time into this podcast get us even more answers but until then thank you everybody who does support and of course if you can't do so financially just sharing the show posting about the show i know if you're listening to this podcast chances are you're in some sort of aqua teen group just get a tattoo of my website across your forehead and post a picture to the group that's all i'm asking is that really so much coming up next aqua teen hunger force T-shirt of the Living Dead premiering October 10th, 2004 with a TV 14 rating, which completely makes sense to me given the very graphic violence against Santa Claus in this episode. I mean, he's a children's icon. You don't want little kids seeing Santa Claus getting his fucking flesh burnt off his body. So makes sense to me. And if we move on to the title of this one, because we've got a little bit to talk about, as we have for a lot of the episodes this season. So... I'm going with T-Shirt of the Living Dead for this episode, which is, to my understanding, what it was called when it came out. That's what it's called on IMDb. But on the DVD, as well as on HBO Max, it's just called T-Shirt of the Dead. So I'm going with the longer title, just again, because that's what I remember it as having have been the entire time I've known about the episode. But I really have to wonder this season why that is. I feel like in season one and two, we never really ran across any alternate titles. But then in season three, it's happening damn near every episode almost and i know we have we've got one more after this there's only two episodes left this season and one of them has an alternate title so i don't know what's going on this season i'll be interested to watch in season four if that happens again i mean there's nothing off the top of my head for the rest of the show really in terms of an alternate title but we will see as we get to them maybe there's one or two other exceptions but again this is all in one season it's like almost every other episode has some sort of alternate title so Again, going with the longer title on this one, T-Shirt of the Living Dead. In terms of our voice cast here, we have our usual suspects. But joining on as the voice of the Easter Bunny, we have Nick Inkatanawat. Of course, we just interviewed him last week on the podcast. So now you know a little bit about the man behind the pink bunny and his brother, Daryl. Outside of that, I want to shout out the editors on this one. We have the quad squad of Ned Hastings, John Breston, Jay Edwards and Phil Sampson. Gotta love these guys. You know, when you see all four on an episode, it's going to be a serious number. So having said all that, what do you say we jump into T-Shirt of the Living Dead? Of course, as usual, we are not covering Space Cadets here. We will do it all in one go over on the Patreon. So what do we open in on in T-Shirt of the Living Dead? I'll tell you. We first see Frylock and Meatwad, they are in a museum, so we are in a new location, and they are in the Egyptian exhibit, and at the top we see Egypt, and then it says the dumb country, that's what it's supposed to say. 
Uh, so we see them hanging out here. They both have headphones on. They both have a cassette player attached to the headphones where they're listening to this information on the exhibit supplied by the museum. We then see that Shake is there, but he's laying down. Like, he's so bored by this that he's incapacitated. Let's hear what he's got to say about this. Oh, God, how much longer? Egypt is so boring. It doesn't even exist. I mean, you don't hear DMX rap about it. I find that this is highly affiligent and edumacationist for my brain because I'm smart, boy. You tell me how this is going to help you get a high-powered six-figure job. You think they asked Tom Cruise this stuff before he signs on his movies? No one has to know this ever. Jake, just go back to the gift shop and let me while and I enjoy the exhibit, okay? You need me here. I am a strong counterpoint to the headphone. <laughs> Shake, I'm a strong counterpoint to the headphones. He thinks he's so important that, that he has to be there to give them that counterpoint because, of course, anything he has to say about this is going to be useful. Shake bringing up DMX. I believe we've talked about him on this podcast, so I'm not going to get into DMX, but he's a rapper. He's a gangster rapper, so it's like, he's not rapping about Egypt. How important can it be? I've looked it up here. I don't believe DMX has rapped about Egypt, so I guess Shake is right about that, although Shake is wrong when he says that Egypt doesn't even exist, uh, it's obviously still very much a country. But to the visual elements of this, first of all, I gotta say, you can see Bob Pettit's concept art of this scene over on his Twitter. There's a link to that in the description. It looks like Egypt, the dumb country, comes directly from Bob because that is in the concept art as well. But I want to talk a little bit about these uh, cassette players that they have, these headphones that they are wearing. They're all wearing the same headphones, but of course, because of the different sizes of the characters, they have to size them differently. So it's funny how, you know, Meat Wad, he's got little headphones on. Shake has to have giant ones, like they're so, so stretched out to fit his head. So it's great to see that. But... Of course, we have seen this exact cassette player headphone combo previously all the way back in season one, episode three, Bus of the Undead. This was the exact same cassette kind of setup that Shake had when they were in Memphis at the Dracula museum grave site thing. Uh, that's, that's exactly the same one. So it's cool to see it show up here. And now all the Aqua Teens get one. It's not just Shake this time. I love the way that Meatwad has his cassette player. He's not actually holding it with his hand. It's just like shoved into the side of his body. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if if that was supposed to be a deliberate choice of having him do that or if it was just easier to animate than having him just hold the cassette player with his hand. Not really sure, but it's very funny to see. In case you're curious, both Shake and Frylock are actually carrying their cassettes. Meatwad, he's got the cheat code, baby. He doesn't have to carry it. Although, you know, Frylock could put it in his box if he wanted to. We know that he keeps lots of stuff in there, but I guess he's just choosing to hold it. So Shake did correctly mention that DMX did not rap about Egypt. So now Meatwad, he's going to roll over to a giant just tablet, I guess, giant slab with all sorts of hieroglyphics on it. Of course, hieroglyphics being the ancient Egyptian writing system, which is comprised of these kind of like pictographs. It's, I mean, you know what hieroglyphics are. <laughs> so uh, Beatwad rolls over to that. Uh, from what I could see in the hieroglyphics, there aren't really any jokes here. Like there's not any little silly drawings. Uh, it's just, you know, your kind of typical fair birds, snakes, things like that. Uh, to my knowledge, these are real hieroglyphics that Bob used here. But just some hieroglyphics. And Meatwad's going to point to one and say, hey, is that DMX? And then they're going to talk about it. And then it's going to pan over to Shake, who will then flip them all off. He'll flip them the bird. And then they'll kind of talk about that as well. Hey, who's this old boy here? Is that DMX? Oh, that's Osiris, the Egyptian god of the dead. Hey, hey, look, over here. Look at this. What's that mean in Egypto? Well, that's you telling me to uh, sit and spin. Bingo! Now do it! Shut up, Shake. I'm trying to hear this. All right, so something interesting that I just noticed right now is that when Shake flips off Frylock and Meatwad, he uses both of his hands. He flips them off with both fingers. And to do that, he obviously has to put the cassette player somewhere because he's normally holding it. So he kind of, like, attaches it to his hip somehow. It's not clear how... But it's like clipped on there, but then we see him again holding it. So not really sure. It's like I would just fucking clip it there and forget about it. But again, maybe he just wants to hold it. It's fun seeing the Aqua Teens deal with this kind of Egyptian stuff, considering, you know, the uh, outro has the Egyptian imagery. And if you're a patron, then you've heard me talk a little bit more about this over on the Patreon because we did cover colon movie film, which, of course, has that whole Egyptian opening. So it's fun to see it dealt with here a little bit earlier before the colon movie film came out. 
back to the title on this episode, uh, T-Shirt of the Living Dead. I wonder if they kind of changed it to T-Shirt of the Dead to match Book of the Dead, which was, of course, like an ancient Egyptian burial practice, I assume mostly for uh, higher up people. But, but what the Book of the Dead was, was a, a text that would be placed on the coffin or the, or the burial chamber of whoever was dead. And it included like spells and just kind of like helpful tips and tricks, I guess, for lack of a better word, on how to get through the afterlife or, or to uh, assist in the journey in the underworld, that kind of thing. So I wonder if the uh, title on this episode is supposed to reflect that. But moving on to our next scene here, they're now going to focus in on a t-shirt that there is a uh, mannequin, but it has the head of a jackal. Uh, so it's like this ancient mannequin kind of thing. It is wearing this t-shirt, and we will hear more of the audio that they are listening to, which will explain what this t-shirt is. Visually, the shirt, it's just got some hieroglyphics on it. The shirt is very old-looking, and they're all checking it out. Legend has it that Osiris, the Egyptian god of the dead, wore this ancient t-shirt on hot days in his... under... In the underworld. <laughs> it was given to him by an ancient bird. Oh my god, the the boy, guy in the world. Shut up. Some say it gave him the power to know and do anything. <laughs> and that's why most of the dead in the underworld referred to him as an ass. Wow. <laughs> Dang, that is some kind of magic t shirt. Yeah, it is. Now continue to your left and view Egypt's pathetic and ignorant attempt at a cellular phone. <laughs> So this is like a giant, just like 80s looking cell phone that's just set up there made out of stone, obviously a uh, bit of a gag for the show. But but Shake is transfixed on this whole T-shirt of the dead. He's like, like it, it, it can grant you whatever powers you want, whatever wishes you want. So, of course, you know, Shake is interested in that. And the narrator here, we can clearly hear it is Dave Willis. And Shake starts to talk at a certain point during the explanation of the shirt. And what the narrator says is that the shirt was given to Osiris by an ancient bank when he opened an ancient checking account. And uh, I have a Chase Bank uh, pizza cutter. Banks will give you these little freebies to, to incentivize you to open up with them. Now my pizza cutter... It cuts pizza. I can't be mad at that. It doesn't give me any special powers. I can't, I can't, you know, make the Easter bunny come out of nowhere. But, I mean, at least I got a sliced up pizza now. It's not too bad. To be fair, most of what I probably would be wishing for would be sliced up pizzas. So, ultimately, it works out. Cut out the middleman, Chase Bank. I like it. As I said previously... The shirt just has hieroglyphics on it, and I read before that the shirt said, you are dumb in hieroglyphics, and I'm like, ah, I doubt it, but I went to a hieroglyphics translation website, and I typed in, you are dumb, and yeah, basically the same thing pops up, so I think that's what they did. They probably went to some website, typed it in, and called it a day. I cannot imagine the actual hieroglyphic system works like that, because I was looking into it a little bit, and it seems like it's mostly just like... They attach certain symbols to certain, you know, alphabet letters. And it's like, well, the Egyptians weren't, they didn't base their hieroglyphics off of our alphabet. So I don't know how true it is, but there is truth to the shirt is supposed to say you are dumb. So there's that. I know I've already mentioned this, but I really want to bring it back up that in that previous clip, we got a nice shot of all three Aqua teens there with their cassette players and just how much smaller Meat Wads has to be. It's like, what has he got? Micro cassette tapes in there or something? But uh, moving on now, Frylock is going to want to keep going on with the exhibit. But as I said, Shake, he's really obsessed with this T-shirt. He's got to have it. So at first we see him. There's, there's a lot of like visual beats in this upcoming clip. So first we see Shake. He has a bottle of spray paint and he sprays it next to the T-shirt. So the way the T-shirt is situated is it's on the mannequin, the Anubis head uh, Anakin or the jackal head mannequin. But that has like a, a glass box over it, as you would expect. So Shake's going to spray around the box, and then we will see that there are like, there's like a laser grid system in case, you know, anybody tries to fuck with the glass. So he sprays that and sees it. And then we see Shake later where he's coming down from the ceiling, which is ridiculous. Like, you know, like he broke in, which he didn't have to do. He's coming down from the ceiling, but now he's wearing a totally different outfit. He's got on like a black ski mask. He's got like a black shirt on. He looks like he's ready for business. And he comes down from the ceiling, and then he has Meatwad turn into a hammer. You think he's going to use the hammer Meatwad to, to break into the glass, but he doesn't. He, he just has a lead pipe or whatever at his side. He hits the glass, 
grabs the t-shirt. Uh, he grabs the whole mannequin, actually. Runs away with it. And then Meatwad's just sitting there in his hammer form. And then he will get tackled by a bunch of guards. Come on, Shake. You go ahead. I'll be right there. <laughs> Look at you. You think about stealing that shirt, don't you? I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yes. Now take the form of a hammer. Okay. <laughs> Now what? <laughs> hey, how you doing? So that's Meatwad getting dogpiled on by six security guards. And I want to talk about that spray paint that Shake uses at the beginning of that clip. We actually saw that back in the third episode of this season in Remooned. That is the spray paint bottle that, that Ur and Enignoct were using to spray paint rocks on the moon. Same spray paint bottle here, although I remembered back in Season 2, Episode 22, The, when Frylock moves out, that the Moon Knights show up in that episode and they have spray paint as well. At least Ur does, and that is not the same bottle. So I think that this spray paint bottle is new to season three, and I think this is the second time that we are seeing it here. But yeah, just so funny to suddenly see Shake. He's wearing the this thieves outfit. He's coming down from from some sort of rope thing on the ceiling. He's got he's got a little microphone up to his mouth, so ideally he could talk to his co-conspirators, but it's just him in this case. So, Shake successfully got the shirt, and I do want to mention again Bob Pettit's concept art. Link to that in the description, because you can see that the idea was for the shirt to be on some sort of mannequin, because that was easier for Shake to grab when the glass was broken, as opposed to, like, if the shirt was displayed some other way, then they would have had to change the texture of the shirt or just the look of the shirt, etc., etc. So the idea was for it to be on a mannequin, although the mannequin that Bob draws doesn't have a head on it like in the episode. But the shirt is different in this concept art. In the concept art, the shirt has Osiris's head on it. There is no hieroglyphics on the shirt. It's just like that kind of dog head thing on it. So a little bit different there, but Shake, he got the shirt. He was successful. I'm actually kind of blown away that he was so successful here. So we're going to cut to the Aqua Teen's house. Meatwad's there. He's not in jail. We don't have to worry about that. But we see Shake. He's not wearing the shirt. It's all stretched out on him. It barely fits him, as you would expect, because Shake is so thick uh, with two C's. But the neck especially is very stretched out to fit Shake here. And the shirt is letting off this awesome particle effect just to convey that it's old. Also, maybe that it's magical. But I think also just that it's, it's a dusty old shirt. But mostly, as we will see, not in our next clip, but an upcoming clip, the shirt also stinks. No, it's mine. No way. I'm keeping this. I need to get him in trouble for this. You think I like getting my friends in trouble? I didn't say anything. You saw it. <laughs> I read your mind. Oh, yeah? Well, what am I thinking? <laughs> oh, that's cute. You're trying to come up with something for me to think of, but you can't. Because your brain is permanently unplugged. You know, you may be right. I think that that t-shirt does work. Well, Shake, I do know that you're going to take that t-shirt back. But this gives me the power to know it all. Well, back there, you said it gave you the power to read mine. So which is it? Um, I don't know. But you said that you know it all. And now you say you don't know? It has powers, okay? Everyone... Okay? This is just some great Aqua Teen dialogue here. They're just going back and forth. Kind of how dumb Shake is. Like, he doesn't know if the shirt, like, tells him everything or if he can just read minds with it. He seemingly doesn't know how to use it at all. We will see upcoming in the episode that Meatwad will know how to use it. But Shake, I don't think, ever actually does anything with the shirt on. He claims he read their minds, but... Obviously, he didn't really do that, and I love Meatwad especially grilling him on this. The the least capable character of grilling somebody is, is doing it successfully on Shake. I love the way that Meatwad's like, but you said that you know it all, and now you say you don't know? <laughs> like, it's just, I don't know. I just love the way that they're kind of going back and forth and, and making Shake own up to this. And I want to shout out the way that Shake is wearing the shirt, because it's very funny, because the sleeves just kind of go over his hands. You don't actually see his hands with the shirt on because the it, it's a t-shirt. It's not a long sleeve shirt, but his hands are, you know, they're tiny attached to his side and these just cover those. I think it's a great little touch. Like I said earlier though, there is a, a particle effect coming off this shirt. That shirt is stankin'. <laughs> and now you're gonna say that it smells like ass. Because it does smell like ass, man. That t-shirt is over five million years old. You know what I'm thinking? Did you need to wash the ass out of that shirt? Well, who better to wash the ass out of that shirt than my slave, which is you? Go forth to the washroom and work for my health, you dirty jackal! <laughs> so that is Shake throwing the shirt onto Meatwad, making him wash the shirt. 
which of course is a very bad idea, as we will see in the episode. But I mean, you could just kind of see that coming from a mile away. I wouldn't trust Meatwad to clean my clothes. But Frylock says something here that the shirt is over 5 million years old. Now, humans, I think we date back to around 300,000 years ago. So 5 million is very old. Ancient Egypt being about 5,000 years old as of this recording, of course. Maybe if you're listening 1,000 years in the future, well, then it's going to be older then. But uh, Egypt was unified around 3100 BCE. And that's like really when it became as we know it as ancient Egypt. So again, 5,000 years ago, not quite 5 million, but this shirt was supposedly owned by a god. So I don't think any of this really applies to, to a mythical deity. Who knows? The shirt is supposedly 5 million years old. We're entrusting it to Meatwad. Let's cut and see what Meatwad's doing with it. Now it's in the washing machine. It's not like he's a complete moron in these regards. So Meatwad, we will see him in the hallway with a washing machine. It'll be shaking around, doing its thing. And Shake will come up to inquire about how long it's taking. What the hell's taking you so long? You need to chill. I've got a whole load in there. A here. load? <laughs> what could you possibly have in there? You're prancing around here naked like you're living the, the friggin' summer of love? From washing my Christmas sock, boy. I want to be prepared. <laughs> For when Santa comes. Santa is not coming this summer. Yes, he is. I put on your t-shirt and called out to him with my brain waves. <laughs> you did what? The t-shirt is not to be abused. It is to be thrown in there with a full bottle of bleach in very <laughs> hot water. Shake, I read the tag. It said cold water only. Oh, yeah, like you can read a bunch of birds and squiggles. Okay. I decide what will be airbrushed on the back. Bye. All right. <laughs> I like that uh, Shake's like, you can't read a bunch of birds and squiggles. And me was like, I can. I guess, if you know, we've seen his handwriting. It is pretty similar to that. But very cute here. Meatwad's doing his laundry. He's washing his Christmas sock, which, of course, is just like a stocking, like a Christmas stocking, as we will see in our next clip. But yeah, Meatwad here, he's doing a full load. But it's funny because, like, we will see it's seemingly just the T-shirt and then the stocking. So that's not really a full load. But to touch on some of the visuals here now, of course, I am brought back to Season 1, Episode 5, Balloonenstein, where Shake has Meatwad in the dryer. So, of course, that's a different asset. It's a dryer. It's a front-loading dryer. And in this case, it's a washing machine where you load on the top. It's not a front-loading washing machine. But this washing machine, very dinged up, very old. Again, looks like they got it from the trash or something like that. And it's shaking so much, it makes me think that the belt is messed up on the washing machine, which will cause the washing machine to shake around like that. Just just get off center and in the, in the momentum of moving all that those wet clothes around will throw it off balance and make it go crazy like that. I think that's what's going on here. Their carpet is like stained, it looks like. There's like water stains everywhere. I guess this thing isn't isn't uh, filtering out correctly. I don't know what the deal is, but yeah, you can see there's water damage to the carpet, to the wall a bit. And in the background, we see their detergent, and it's called Spurt. It says, new Spurt with bleach. Let me tell you, if the Aqua Teens use Spurt, then I'm going to start using it too. I like Shake's like, you have to use bleach and like the hottest water you can, which both of those you would not use on an old shirt like this. Frylock points that out. <laughs> he read the tag. I like that there's a tag on this ancient shirt. It said, cold water only. And Meatwad didn't know none of this. I guess we're about to see the ramifications of this. Because the washing machine is done, Meatwad's going to go in there. He's going to get out his, his little stocking, which is very cute. There's kind of like a, uh, a glitter glue Meatwad on the stocking, which I love. I don't know if, if when you were a kid, if you, you know, did like your initial or whatever in, in this glitter glue material. But I definitely did when I was younger. Nice to see it here. But there's a problem because Meatwad, he didn't follow the directions on the back of the shirt. In fact, there's a few uh, laundry directions he didn't follow here because we first will see his his stocking here and it's faded. It's, it's just the whole thing is basically pink because the red dye in what was supposed to just be the bottom part. I assume the top was supposed to be white, like a typical Christmas stocking. It's just bled all over everything. So the whole sock is pink. We'll see the shirt as well is also dyed pink. But not only that, but because of the hot water... It's shrunk down to minuscule sizes. Oh, shoot, look at this. Hold it. Hey, here's your thing. <laughs> well, at least it's clean, you know what I mean? Yeah, and as soon as I get it on, <laughs> I'm going to clean out your little skull with a possessed ice cream spoon. But I'm going to have a demon do it because I'm very tired. Shake, stop. Well, 
Someone please shake, yank shake, on this! Shake, stop! You're gonna rip it! Rip this! It'll fit! No, no, it won't. Yes, it will! No, it won't! The only person who can wear this now is Meatwad. Hello, Hanada. <laughs> so the, the shirt is so tiny, Shake is trying to put it on. It obviously won't go over him. So it's a Meatwad's now. I'm surprised that Shake is so okay with this, but I guess he just kind of admits that, like, there's nothing I can do about it. It won't fit me, so at this point, what can I do? Although I'm surprised he's not more mad at Meatwad for uh, messing the shirt up in this way. I absolutely love Meatwad. He has to jump in the washing machine to get everything out. And uh, he he throws Shake's shirt at, at him in the face. And he's like, yeah, here's your thing. Like He doesn't really care at all about this this magical shirt. And again, Meatwad's like, I'm doing a load of laundry. And it's just two things in there. At least that we see. Maybe there's other things that we didn't see. I said it once. I'm going to say it again. Seeing the little Meatwad drawing on the stocking is so goddamn adorable. And it, it pisses me off that Adult Swim doesn't sell these, because I would I would buy two. They're so cute. So Meatwad is going to put the shirt on now, this, I assume, still wet and damp shirt. He's just going to throw it right on. Why not? It's Meatwad. Who knows what else is on him anyways. He's going to put the shirt on, and it's fun because it kind of deforms his his look. He's not a ball of meat with a shirt on now. He's like this weird amorphous... Uh, I, I wouldn't say amorphous, actually, almost man-like Meatwad wearing this shirt just because of the way it forces his meat to conform to this shirt. So, another fun moment this season where we're getting a new kind of look from Meatwad. Of course, we had South Bronx Paradise Diet, where Meatwad was wearing that spandex all episode. Now we have him in a new form here, on top of the new hammer form that we saw earlier in the episode. I feel like maybe I brushed over that and didn't shout it out enough. But yeah, we saw Meatwad there in a brand new form. Finally, we don't get those very often. Uh, but we got Meatwad there as a hammer. Now he's here as some sort of man thing with this t-shirt on. And Shake, he's going to have a request for what he wants Meatwad to do next. Oh, yeah? Well, put it on and do my bidding. Okay. There we go. <laughs> what do you mean? Hmm, let's, uh, why don't we call up, uh... Oh, I know. How about a plague of snakes to devour you for your insolence? Okay, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's play hide and seek, Meatwad. <laughs> what the? Is that the plague of snakes I asked for? I don't know. Hey, is you the plague of snakes he asked for? Uh uh. I'm the Easter Bunny. Who's the Easter Bunny? I know that! <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me take another crack at it. Hold on. I'm the Easter Bunny's twin brother, Daryl. <laughs> this is ridiculous! You know what? I'm just gonna go to the mall. I'll have my cell phone on, okay? In case something goes wrong. Hit me on the cell. Of course, that is Nick in Katanawa playing the Easter Bunny. And I'm the Easter Bunny's twin brother, Daryl. <laughs> so, uh, I first of all, I want to say I passed up a, a really funny line in the previous clip, which is Meatwad saying, hello, hand-me-down. He's got that hand-me-down shirt now. Of course, Meatwad, he doesn't really know how to summon certain things for Shake. I guess he's just a slave to his own desires, which seemingly is the Easter Bunny and his brother, Daryl. Easter bunny, he's just a little pink bunny uh, with a, a green vest on. He's holding a, an Easter egg basket with some, some colorful eggs. I see a purple, a red, a yellow, an orange, some good looking eggs in there. And as you would expect, Daryl, he's just literally a carbon copy of the Easter bunny. It's the same exact asset. Frylock, as you heard, he just noped out of the scene. He's not dealing with them getting up to all sorts of shenanigans here. Which is kind of something that Matt and Dave have to do in order for the direction of the episode to continue in this crazy way. Because if Frylock was there the whole time, then it wouldn't quite be able to work out as easily. But now that Frylock's gone, they basically just have full clearance to do whatever they want with, with Shake and Meatwad getting up to all sorts of crazy stuff. Because there's nobody to keep them in line. Frylock's gone, and Shake, he's going to try to have Meatwad spawn him something else now. And Meatwad, first he's going to spawn a bunch more Easter Bunnies. But then also, he's going to spawn the man himself, Santa Claus. Well, I feel like we got a communication breakdown here, because, you know, you say snakes, and all I hear from you is Easter Bunny, Easter Bunny, Easter Bunny. All right, look, let's just go with something simple first. All right, here's something simple. Santa Claus! What is wrong with you? Master Shake, you've been a naughty boy today. Don't play with me, fat man. Santa, did you get my letter? Meet one. Why did you call me in the middle of July? I want me some presents. I've been a good boy for the first quarter of this year and most of the second quarter. It's the middle of f***ing July. I was sleeping. Well, but I... The sweet little elves don't even come in till September. Okay, but... I've been a good boy for the first quarter of this year and most of the second quarter. 
that's probably one of my favorite Meatwad quotes. But we we learn in the episode it's July is when this is taking place. And Meatwad, he summons Santa, as you can tell, voiced by Dave Willis. Dave's doing overtime on this episode. He did the voice, of course, earlier at the museum. Obviously, Meatwad and Carl, who we have yet to see so far in this episode. And now, the voice of Sandy Claus. But Santa here looking just very Santa-esque. Not a whole lot of notable things to describe. Just your typical Santa Claus. And he's not happy. I like that they have a pissed off Santa here. He's trying to sleep, and he was summoned by Meatwad. There is a discrepancy in that previous clip that I noticed, uh, some sort of uh, oversight, I guess, on the animation process, because when Santa Claus is summoned, you hear Meatwad yell out, Santa Claus! But it cuts to him while that's still being said, like towards the tail end of Claus, and Meatwad's mouth is not moving. So it's pretty obvious that he didn't actually say it, because again, it cuts to him and it's still kind of saying, and his mouth is like shut. But, I mean, it, it's such a, a short discrepancy that I don't blame them for not trying to fix that. So, Meatwad obviously summoned Santa to get what he wants from Santa. And as we will see, that was fairly unnecessary because he's going to ask Santa for something. Santa won't be able to give it to him, so then Meatwad will just make it appear. Well, I want a unicorn with a horn and a banana suit and a banana suit, too. <laughs> Put, give me that. Well, I'll just waltz on down to the free present store. You think I have money to buy all that? So that is Meatwad making it appear. I'm cutting in here because there's a few different visual iterations that are going to happen. So first, it's just a unicorn spawned with a horn like you would expect. It has a seat on it and the feet have uh, have like wheels on them. So there's two wheels and it, it's just very normal looking, I guess, for what you'd expect a unicorn kind of bike to look like. But Meatwad wanted a horn, so he goes to think again, and the the, the unicorn has a normal unicorn horn. That's going to turn into a sort of, like, trumpet kind of horn, and then that won't be quite right. I guess Meatwad, you know, wants, like, a horn you can honk while riding the bike, and then so he thinks again, and that horn will turn into a an old kind of gramophone horn. So you've seen those old record players with the horn coming off of them. It turns into one of those, and you'll hear some kind of vinyl noise. Ah, oh, please, no. No, not that kind of horn. Come on, use the hell. Well, I didn't do it. You did it. <laughs> oh. So you wouldn't have any coffee. Ah, <laughs> get in there. I'm sorry. He just woke me up, and it pisses me off. Oh, that'll work. <laughs> For now, but no telling what I'm going to want later. All right, stop! So it's so funny, again, that I, I'm really appreciating this now, that Meatwad summoned Santa to get the toys he wants, just to make them himself. Like, Santa being here is not necessary at all. There was actually a cool little visual thing in that clip that we don't normally get from the show. So Meatwad spawns the unicorn bike, and then at a certain point, the camera focuses in on Master Shake and Santa Claus talking, which they are in the background behind Meatwad. So what it does is it keeps the unicorn in the forefront of that shot, but blurs the unicorn. And we don't see that a lot. They don't blur a whole lot of stuff on this show in that way. So it kind of stood out to me when I saw it. You know, I'm really surprised that they even bothered to do that. But hey, it's there. You can see it if you want to. To recap on the episode so far, Meatwad, he has spawned an Easter bunny, his brother Daryl, and then a bunch of other brothers who are as of yet unnamed. He spawned Santa Claus. Shake is not happy about this, so he's gonna he's gonna call Meatwad out on this, saying you're not abusing the shirt in the right way. This isn't what I want to be done with it. So Meatwad will then create another thing outside. We won't see it at first, but eventually we will. It's a giant Easter egg outside of a very decorated Easter egg. But it has what I could best describe as like frog's legs and little arms, and it has eyes and a a mouth. Santa Claus is going to go outside to take a look at whatever it is, because we didn't see it before that point. And then this giant Easter egg thing is going to blow a big ball of fire all over Santa Claus. This is my shirt, and you are not abusing it properly. Look out there, them. <laughs> How's that grab it? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on out here? Why, well, it's a big old happy Easter egg. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on here. So I like Meatwad using this this jargon. He's like, how's that grab you? He's like trying to please Master Shake with what he's doing here. It seems like Meatwad is genuine and wanting to make Shake happy. And this Easter egg thing outside, it kind of jumps. It's, it seems very happy after it, it shoots a fireball at Santa Claus. It doesn't seem inherently evil. It's just, it's just a giant monster. It doesn't know any better. 
Something I forgot to mention is even though it does have these kind of frog legs, it has these talons at the end of them, which is very funny. I've owned bullfrogs growing up. I've seen lots of frogs and toads in my day. I don't think I've seen any with these kinds of long talons, but maybe it's a possibility. Who knows? When Santa goes outside, we get some fun discrepancies between the close shots and the wide shots. So we see Santa open the door. He goes outside and we see the doors open. But then we get a wide shot of the entire Aqua Teen house and we see that the door is closed. And then we go into another close shot and the door is open again. But not just that. It's the same thing with the windows. In the close shots, the windows, the uh, curtains are open as, as they were when we were inside the house. But on the wide shots, the, the, the windows are closed, or the, the curtains are closed, rather. So uh, just a fun little discrepancy there. Obviously, I don't anticipate the Aqua Teens are inside closing and opening the curtains and closing and opening the door. Just a fun little, uh, fun little visual error there. Something that is not so fun is, of course, now Santa is on the ground burning, and Carl's going to come over to complain because the giant egg monster, we learn its name is Eggzilla, it crushed Carl's house. His house is just flattened when we see it again. Poor Carl here. It's been a while since we've really gotten a nice Carl house destruction. Of course, we, f we first saw it back in episode two, Escape from Leprechopolis. And uh, it's just nice to see it here. You don't see his house getting destroyed much these days. So he was really due for some sort of incident like that. But Meatwad is going to spawn another egg monster for Eggzilla to have a girlfriend or, or a date to, because he's going to prom now. So we'll see Eggzilla. He's now wearing a tuxedo and he's dancing with a similar kind of egg monster that has green long hair, a little bow on her head, and she's got red lips. This is a very beautiful couple and they're dancing on top of Carl's destroyed house. Hey! There's a friggin' Easter egg in my yard! Well, that's probably Eggzilla, Carl. Who's that fire breathing Easter egg come out of my mind? Of course! Well, it could oh, be his girlfriend. The is melting into my skin. Who's in my mind now? Who's going still? Oh, yeah, no, there's two of them now. Who's at the prom? Hey, make sure the house is completely crushed if you could. That's okay. <laughs> They're in love. Hey, run along. So that is Carl running off, but in that scene, we had three separate characters say something, all three voiced by Dave Willis. Very funny there. We heard a little bit of Santa Claus outside saying that, you know, his skin's on fire or whatever. He's not having a good time there. And neither is Carl because his house is getting destroyed. At a certain point when Carl was talking to them, we saw inside their house and we saw the Easter Bunny and Daryl kind of peeking out and we saw the unicorn thing uh, roll away. So we just kind of see really what Meatwad's getting up to here with when his imagination runs rampant in this way. We have Eggzilla here, of course, an obvious call to Godzilla, the, the infamous 1954 Japanese monster, the, the Daikaiju. Gotta wonder who'd win in a fight, Godzilla or Eggzilla. My bet's on Eggzilla, baby, because I think if Meatwad saw Eggzilla losing, he'd just spawn him like a gun or, or some more friends to help him out or something like that. Like I said, Carl runs off from the Aqua Teen's house, and this being that same animation that we saw back in Dusty Gazanga's, the previous episode. So now they're like, shit, now we have Carl running finally after, you know, 50 episodes or whatever. Now we can have him run around and do stuff. So they have him run over to his car. He goes into this just like blind rage because he starts beating the shit out of his car with with a, uh, an iron pipe or something like that, busting through it. And I went back and checked. This is the same pipe, seemingly. It's the same asset, at least. That Shake used at the beginning of the episode, when Shake busted in and stole the shirt, this is the same pipe that he used for that, but uh, Carl's using it now to bust open his car, he's just going into this manic rage. Hey, what are you doing? You missed my car! Help me out with this! There we go! Oh my god, what, what is going on here? Did I not tell you to call me? I got your number. <laughs> So that's that's Frylock coming home to this absolutely batshit insane scene of these monsters here. Carl's beating the shit out of his car too wicked. I want to mention here that the graphic too wicked on Carl's car is reversed. It's like backwards because they had to flip the car so that the front windshield is facing the Aqua Teen's house because that's the direction Carl comes from. So uh, there's the backwards too wicked getting just destroyed by Carl. Uh, and then Santa Claus is there on fire, of course. And this, as you know, our classic space ghost, Hanson Flame. Ooh, that old flame is just thrown right on top of Sandy Claus here. Poor guy. So moving into our next scene now, because Frylock has to try and clean all this up, this absolute mess that, that Meatwad and Shake got into. We see they have Santa Claus in the living room on the floor, and he is a mess. This is one of the most gruesome drawings that we've seen on Aqua Teen. 
I mean, this is up amongst the ranks of, of uh, the shaving when we see Willie Nelson's attic area with all the, the corpses strewn about. But we have Santa Claus here. His face is burnt off, so it's just a skeleton face, but he has one eyeball left in his head. We see his rib cage through his chest. Like, his skin is all burnt. His legs are just skeleton legs at this point. Like, there's nothing on them. And yeah, just burnt flesh. You see into his chest cavity. It's horrible. This is a, a very grotesque drawing. You would not want kids to see this, especially, again, you know, this 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 child-friendly icon like Santa. You don't want to see him in this state. And it's just horrible that the poor guy is still alive, even though we can see his muscles and, and everything like that. So he's thankful to Frylock, but understandably, he's upset that all of this happened to him. Oh, thank you, Frylock. <sighs> If I survive, I'm gonna beat the f out of that little meatball. Look, Santa, I am so sorry, but Meatwad just got a little carried away. That's he all. He got a lot carried away. You know that remote control race car he wants? Oh, yeah, he's gonna get it. Far up his ass. Whoa, 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 whoa. Calm down now, Santa. We might see if the reindeer like meat this now, year. Now, please, now, Santa, you don't get wanna. Out of my way. Don't try to get, get out. out of my now, way. You need to rest and. Oh, and, and you. You're, you're his ass white roommate, aren't you? Oh, if I go down, who will deliver the toys? Toys? I, you? I, I don't know. You have no idea how it works, do you? Don't even have a clue. You know what? Let me borrow your phone. <laughs> I'm going to call the police. No, no, I don't think so. You're not going to do that. Is that is that a mirror? Yeah, bring, bring that to me. How, how does my face look? Well... Like a monster. No, no, you... Oh, kids are going to want to see me under the mistletoe. No, 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 yeah, no, no, right. no, you're okay. You're all right. So you grow your beard back and your eyebrows. I'm horror claws. <laughs> Santa not lying here. He really is Horror Claws. He's not looking too hot. Uh, Frylock at one point had the pink mirror that we've seen throughout the show. And Santa wanted to see himself, but Frylock knows that this would not be a good idea to show him what he really looks like. It's, again, a surprise he's even alive. I guess we have to chalk that up to his his status as a magical being, Santa Claus, is the reason that he's still here. Any other human, I think, would be done for at this point. As you heard in the sound effects there, there's a lot of machinery that Santa's hooked up to. He has an oxygen mask on, and this machinery we've seen before. We saw it back in Little Brittle. It's the same machinery that Little Brittle was hooked up to. The oxygen mask is the same oxygen mask from the poster that Little Brittle was on where he was wearing a, an oxygen mask. Uh, in terms of the machinery that Santa's hooked up to, the screens this time around are on. Uh, these Again, these being the same screens and machines that were in uh, Little Brittle's episode in the, in the hospital room. In Little Brittle, the screens were not on. I went back and checked. Those screens never came on. There's like a little, like, you know, graph. Like, it's supposed to be like, I don't know, a, a vital chart or something like that. It's not animated, though. It's just it's just like a static image. But in, in, th in this episode, the screens are on. And I, I wonder if Frylock went and stole those items from Tragic Castles or if he just had them around. But, I mean... If my eyes don't deceive me, it's the same model as the one from Little Brittle, so gotta wonder where Frylock got those. At some point, Santa's moving around, like he's moving his head up and things like that, and the, the wire connected to the oxygen mask moves very realistically. They did a great job on that. So Santa is obviously in so much pain, and then Frylock is gonna call Meatwad into the room. So Meatwad's gonna come in, and he's gonna be wearing this, like, banana helmet mask kind of thing. We'll talk about that more on the other side. So he comes in wearing this banana thing, but Meatwad's pretty surprised at what's happening here. And then at a certain point in the clip, the Easter Bunny will come in and suggest giving Santa, like, a chocolate Easter, bu Easter Bunny or something to make him feel better... And we'll get a cut to the three characters, so Frylock, Meatwad, and Santa Claus, all just looking over at the Easter Bunny. And Meatwad particularly looks very pissed off that the Easter Bunny would suggest this. And then in the clip, you'll hear Frylock will fire off some sort of energy ball, which will hit the Easter Bunny in the face, blasting his face off, like, behind him. So essentially, you have the Easter Bunny's face is on the wall. There's blood on the wall behind him. And then the body is just there with no face. It has a head, but the face is blown out. Oh, God. It's getting cold in here. Uh-oh, you're going in the shop. No, I'm not. Me what? Get in here! Yeah, take a look at what you've done to me! <laughs> you need to fix this! <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Why don't you just give him a big chocolate Easter Bunny? <laughs> yeah! That'll work. <laughs> I said, why don't you just give him a big chocolate? <laughs> I said, why don't you just give him a <laughs> poor Easter Bunny here? Again, played by Nick Inkatanawad. I love the job that he did on the Easter Bunny in this episode. And yeah, so funny to see Meatwad pissed off at the Easter Bunny for suggesting that. 
I wonder if Meatwad, like, I don't know exactly how this shirt works. Couldn't he just wish for Santa to be better or imagine Santa being healed or something? Regardless, there's something else we need to address regarding what Meatwad is wearing. It is not the shirt. When he comes into that scene, he's wearing this banana kind of mask. And it, it, it encompasses his entire head. And at first when I watched this, and I watched this a few times before starting my coverage of the episode here on the podcast, I was like, what is that? What, like, I don't understand this. And also, Meatwad comes into the room wearing that, but then as soon as the Easter Bunny shows up, which is like a second later, we see Meatwad without it on. So I'm like, what the heck was that? Is that a mistake or something? But... When doing this podcast episode, I realized earlier Meatwad says that he wants a banana suit. So seemingly, this is what he wanted. Like, he created it and was wearing it later in the episode. So a great, very quick, pretty obscure callback to earlier in the episode. Because I watched through a couple times and didn't even pick up on that until pretty much now. So uh, that's what that little uh, banana thing he's wearing is. Where it goes a split second later, once we see Meatwad again, I don't know, but it makes more sense now. It's not as random as I thought it was. And you know, I love Meatwad coming in saying, yes, I'm <laughs> he just wants to know what's going on. But Meatwad here, he seems to feel bad about this. He doesn't really seem upset that the Easter Bunny is dead, but he feels bad about Santa. So the only thing Meatwad could think to do is to put Santa out of his misery. So Meatwad will start just kind of like pushing everything over and destroying the machine. There's also the oxygen tank. That Santa's hooked up to. This, of course, being the same oxygen tank from Little Brittle. Uh, Meatwad pushes that over. He just, like, he's, like, ready to pull the plug on Santa Claus. Look, what am I supposed to do here with this? I know. You were asleep. <laughs> he broke in. Meatwad. He flipped the switch. Bad wire and lights him on fire. Don't listen to him. No one knows he's down here. Come on. I like the way this t-shirt is making you act. Oh, is that right? Oh, you got a mind to rap? Look. No, 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 Meatwad. Nothing like that, please. Look, you got the t-shirt on. Just, just do something, will you? Okay, okay, okay. Just let, 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 let me concentrate here for a second. Oh, boy! I lose on a cycle! So that is them trying to address what I said. Like, oh, couldn't, couldn't Meatwad just fix up Santa Claus? But... He can't, but he can make a new unicycle. But what you heard, you heard Santa yelling there a lot. That was Meatwad. At a certain point, he jumps onto Santa's stomach, which, of course, would be very painful for Santa Claus in this very raw state. You know, because his fucking flesh got burnt off because of Meatwad. So that hurts him, and then Meatwad gets off, and then he jumps back on Santa again at the end of the clip to get to the unicycle that he just spawned. It's a unicycle. It seems like it has a motor on it, so it's like a motorized unicycle. I don't know if I trust Meatwad to try and drive that around, but uh, he's got it now. But they're not going to dwell on it. Because moving on to our next scene in the episode, we do a bit of a time jump. I really kind of didn't think about this at first, but the episode it's established takes place in July. But now it's seemingly Christmas because they're going on a Christmas run and they're delivering toys. So it is over six months in the future. I think one of the biggest time jumps we've ever seen on Aqua Teen, the first that comes off the top of my head would be in The Clowning, which jumps ahead 67 years into the future but this one you know would jump in six months i think that might be second place of course there is an episode like supercomputer which does deal with a kind of like time lapse but i don't consider that the same as this because in that one we kind of go back in time as opposed to jumping ahead in time so yes we are six months in the future we're doing a present run dropping off some presents the way the scene is set up is we first just see some some reindeer running through the sky. Then we pan over to see that we have Frylock steering the sled. And Frylock here wearing a, a Christmas hat, like a Santa hat. He's got on these fake kind of gray eyebrows and a big gray beard. Or white, rather, not gray. Then we have Meatwad in the sled with Frylock. And Meatwad, of course, has his shirt on. And then on like the second half of the of the sled here, we have Santa Claus, who's in this kind of bubble thing. Like there's this plastic over him that would protect him from the elements. And they're like doing a skin graft, but with a soccer ball. So Santa, he has something of skin now, but it's all like this soccer kind of texture material. It's very, very funny. It kind of gives me a flashback to Total Recarl the body horror with Carl in that episode, specifically the eyeball body that he has. Well, now we're kind of seeing it here with Santa Claus, where he has this, uh, it's not eyeballs, of course, it's a soccer pattern, but the pattern itself, to me, reminiscent of Total Recarl. Poor Santa here, he's still got the oxygen mask on. He has a very fake-looking beard. It's funny because Frylock's beard is like a realistic Santa beard, but then the one Santa has is very clearly fake. It's just like blonde hair or something on a, on a stick, maybe. 
but there's a, a little bit of machinery in the in the tent with Santa here. And I notice his legs aren't grafted with the soccer ball texture. Those are still a little raw looking, but maybe those didn't get burnt as bad as, you know, the rest of his body. At least his thighs. We don't actually see his feet, which previously were skeletons. So I don't know what, what's going on with those. But we see that they are delivering presents. They're trying to, you know, keep Christmas going, even though Santa can't do it. I like that the Aqua Teens are getting involved in this. You know, it's not often that the Aqua Teens help try and clean up the mess that they create. And then we will see at a certain point, they will drop off, they'll, they'll be in a chimney ready to drop off a present. And what they're doing is having Meatwad basically come up with these because he can spawn stuff because of the shirt. He's supposed to make a wooden train. He can't quite pull it off. Oh man, he's looking good. The elves kind of whipped it up for me at the last minute. You'll be able to do this yourself <laughs> next year. Yeah. Well, look, he's bouncing around in no time, air soccer claw. Santa Claus. Santa Claus is what I said. It's important that I don't leave this tent until the graft fully takes hold to my muscles. Because this is my skin now. <laughs> oh, God. It's okay. It's okay, Santa. Just take your time. Okay, okay. And remember, we do have a lot of houses to go through, so whenever you're ready... Oh, yeah. Uh, I can't see too well with the soccer ball lids. Take it easy. It's okay. But I think that this is Jeffy's place, and if I remember correctly... <laughs> He was a wooden train. Great. Did you hear that, Miwad? Yep, here it is. His very own wooden brain. Train, you idiot. Train. <laughs> Don't you talk ugly to me. I mean, I send it to the moon with my magic shirt. Yeah, I know, master. Jeff is just going to have to bite the bullet on this one. Because it has been a long night, and we ain't even done the eastern seaboard yet. Just give it to him. He's not a, not a bright child. <laughs> He's not a bright child. Uh, Meatwad there, in a rare moment where something Meatwad throws kind of explodes, Meatwad throws that wooden brain down the chimney, and then, like, an explosion comes out the top. I don't know if that's supposed to be the brain, like, if there's a fire going on down there, and that's what's happening, or, or if it's just supposed to be a random explosion, which I assume is supposed to be the case. I mean, it is Aqua Teen after all. So, for most of this episode, Meatwad has not been pretty nasty about his powers, but he, he is here because he kind of threatens Frylock when Frylock yells at Meatwad. You know, Meatwad's like, oh, I'll send you to the moon or whatever with my shirt. So, at this point, it seems like the power has gone to Meatwad's head, but for most of the episode, when we saw the early moments of Meatwad wearing the shirt, he seemed pretty grounded. In fact, he was trying to, trying to make Shake happy with the shirt he was failing at it but it seemed like he was trying to it seemed like he wanted to help santa even though you know he wasn't able to but he wanted to but at this point now i mean as we know whenever meatwad gets any sort of power like this it goes to his head moving on to our very last clip of t-shirt of the living dead we're gonna have shake now we see him because you'll notice i didn't mention him previously we're gonna see shake now and he's at the front of the reindeers. He is turned into a reindeer himself. And obviously, Meatwad must have done this. So it does suggest that Meatwad can, you know, change how people look and things like that. So I don't understand why he can't fix Santa Claus. But regardless, we have Shake here as a reindeer. And his antlers are made out of his Shake straw, which is just a great look. It's so funny. And Shake isn't happy about this. And then towards the end of the clip, we'll have one of the reindeers start to hump Shake. It'll mount him and start enjoying him. Can I ask you a question, Master? You, you said we would be trading off at some point. Is that close? We're going to finish up America, then we do Europe, then you knock out the Middle East yourself. Ew! Crown that river, bitch! <laughs> so Shake's got to knock out the Middle East himself. I can't imagine, like, of all the places to have to knock out for Christmas, I feel like that'd probably be one of the easiest places you, if you have to do it yourself. I mean, how many people there are celebrating Christmas? Uh, can't be any more than North America or anything like that. But yes, that is the end of T-Shirt of the Living Dead and Shake getting humped by a reindeer. I realize I was saying reindeers. I think the plural is just reindeer, right? Regardless, the point I'm trying to make and the important thing here is that Shake actually is getting some in this episode as opposed to Dusty Gazanga's where he thought he was getting laid. Here, he actually has a chance. All it took was for him to become a reindeer. So that is it. That is T-Shirt of the Living Dead, a very fun episode of season three. Before I go into my thoughts on this one, first, what can we learn from this episode of Aqua Teen? And I don't think it's that difficult to see. Follow simple laundry directions here, people. Don't just be mixing and matching colors when it when it when it's important. I mean, for me, I don't I don't I don't separate my colors. I throw them in there, but I also don't use bleach. I think it's just if you're using bleach. And as we saw, the spurt that they were using, their spurt laundry detergent 
had bleach in it. So first of all, they ruined the shirt. Uh, Meatwad did, I guess, but also it was really Shake's fault. The shirt got ruined, but more so, they didn't follow the directions of using cold water. That's what shrunk the shirt, and that's what made it so Shake couldn't wear it. Now, I would probably argue that uh, it might be a good thing that Shake didn't end up with the shirt, because God knows what he would have done with it. But also, when Shake had the shirt, he didn't do anything with it. So, it's possible that, you know, it would have been better off if Meatwad didn't wash it, because Shake would have just continued to not utilize it episode would have been fine. Santa would have been okay. Carl's house would have been fine. Everything would have been okay. Just follow your directions. Don't ruin your clothes. That's what I'm taking away from this one. On to my thoughts on this episode of Aqua Teen. Like I said, going into it, I remembered the part where they were at the museum. I thought that was more of the episode than it really was. Otherwise, I didn't remember a whole lot. I like that they bring in, like, the Easter Bunny. They bring in Santa Claus. It's kind of like this this ambiguous holiday episode. I guess you could throw this one in the mix if you're looking for some Easter viewing. If you're looking for some Christmas viewing, I think this one fits in for those. I like how much of this episode is just them hanging around at the house and just talking. It's so dialogue-driven. There's just long stretches of scenes where the characters aren't even really moving that much. They're just talking to each other, but it's always enjoyable. It's, it's never boring. I think this one has a great pace to it. At this point into season three, Matt and Dave and the rest of the crew, they all have a lot of experience making these kinds of episodes where they don't have to really rely on other characters coming in. Now, in this episode, there are other characters coming in, but not in as much of an important way as something like, let's say, Bus of the Undead, you know? Something like that, where the guest characters are really driving the episode. That's not really the case here. Santa isn't driving the episode much beyond the need to treat his wounds and then also do the Christmas thing at the end. But I've honestly... I feel like they could have not done any of that in this episode, and it still would have been a good episode. They could have just kept them at home fucking around with the shirt. I still would have liked it. So... A very fun, I don't want to say slice of life episode because this one isn't really that rooted in reality, but it's fun to see them at the museum and Shake being bored and and wanting to get the attention of Frylock and Meatwad. Like he interjected uh, and and talked over the, the cassette tape because he wanted people to pay attention to him. Those moments are fun. I like that we got some Carl here. Now it was very short. He was really only in one scene, but it didn't feel forced. Which is interesting. You would think if they were going to throw him in just for one quick moment like that, that it would not be necessary. But I'm glad they did. It was funny to see him especially go berserk, start destroying his own own two wicked. I like when they just got Frylock out of the episode to allow it to devolve into this, this just climax of chaos once Frylock comes back and he sees Eggzilla, he sees Santa on fire, he sees Carl destroying his own house, or destroying his own car while his house is being destroyed. Just just a great moment. I mean, overall, this episode, it's not one of my favorites, but I really enjoyed it. I like this one, I think, more than Dusty Gazanga's. I feel like the, the dialogue is just more in the vein of what I want from Aqua Teen, just that dialogue humor of them kind of dicking around in all these different ways. Also, I want to shout out the scene where where uh, they're really grilling Shake on like, okay, well, what does the shirt do? What powers do you have because of the shirt? And there's just these like stretches of silence while Shake can't really answer these questions. Things like that I love from Aqua Teen. More up my alley than Dusty Gazangas. Oh, that was obviously a very good episode as well. But for T-Shirt of the Living Dead, I gotta give this one just a solid four banana suits out of five. You can't go wrong with this one. I don't think it's an instant classic, but also a very solid episode. I can't really find anything to complain about it. I felt like the pacing was great. The jokes were hilarious. The premise is very funny. And just it's just nice to see Meatwad get powers, you know. We, we've gotten it in the last few seasons, and I'm glad we got it again here. So that is it for me this week. Thanks for hanging out with me, talking teens with me, deep diving into season three with me. We are almost done. I can't believe it that we're almost done with this season. And then, of course, on to season four. If you're a Moon Master, subscribe over at the Patreon. Thank you so much for for supporting the show, allowing it to remain independent, which means I can make it the way that I want it to be made. It really incredibly helps out. If you're not subscribed and you would like to subscribe, you can head over to patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden at the $5 and up tier. You will get the end of the month episode where we're diving into all sorts of stuff. Other Adult Swim shows, which of course we look at through the Aqua Teen lens. Uh, We're diving into other Aqua Teen episodes like Baffler Meal, Radon. Uh, We're going to be covering Space Kataz soon. And also special features 
colon movie film, all sorts of stuff over there at the Patreon. Thank you, Carl, for resubscribing this month. And also thank you to Leche Raton 69 LR69 in the house. Thank you for signing up. And of course, thank you to our Highlander, Nick. There can be only one. Nick, you're a legend. Also, you know, got to shout out our other number one in the Hood G tier patrons. These crazy ass motherfuckers supporting the show at $10 every month. We have Sean, Ian, Captain Buford, Robison, Jason, Carl, and Leche Raton 69. That's what I'm talking about. You guys can have my hand-me-downs any day of the week. I'll see you all next week. Let me tell you, we've got an exciting interview. I think you're going to like it. Until then, take it easy. Keep it cool. Bye-bye. Oh my god, what, what is going on here? Did I not tell you to call me? I got your number.